So I know this is the last talk of the day and it's kind of late and everybody's just kind of sitting there wondering how long, how much longer they're going to be able to stay awake. <laughs> so at least the good news, I guess, is that there's not going to be no more code. Oh, wait, that was the bad news. No, so the good news is we're going to do some exercises now to kind of get you, your blood flowing a little bit and then kind of hope that maybe you'll stay awake for the few, next few minutes then after that. So help me out a bit and participate in this short exercise. I want you to raise an extremity if the next few things apply to you, okay? Have you ever seen a movie? All right, that's not too bad. Ever read a book? We're friends here, come on, you can. <laughs> a book that's not nonfiction, so an actual story in a book, like, okay. Fifty Shades of Grey? Okay, no, never mind. Whoops. Um, have you ever been to the opera? Have I been to the opera? Oh, hey, quite a few. All right. Ballet? Fewer? Okay. Pantomime? Okay, we're not going to push this too far. <laughs> but the, the point is, and I, I wish I had like a handheld microphone because I could just drop it now and walk off the stage at least if I hadn't put three questions there because I said why, how, and when. But I, hope, I think the why should be clear, stories are all around us. We're all used to stories, they're just everywhere. And we, we're really good with stories. We understand them, we know them, and, and they, they work for us, they speak to us. And I wanna talk a bit about that, why that is, and then talk a bit about how we can build stories using data, and then get to this last question, which is kind of the same as the first one, but I'll get to that. So why questions? Why questions? No, why stories? Let's try that, okay? <laughs> Why so many questions on my slides? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> why stories? To answer that, or at least to start answering that, I'm gonna tell you a story. And I should also tell you that most of my slides are gonna be blank, um, because I didn't quite finish them. No, but <laughs> the point here is there is no visual to this, for this. This is a little story that I'm gonna tell you. This is about a young woman who walks into a bar, and this is not a setup for a choke, you know, a rabbi, a priest, and Irene walk into a bar. But a young woman walks into a bar. This is in, uh, in Berlin in the 1920s. A young Russian woman who is doing her PhD at that, or her graduate studies at this point, in a new field, in a field that was new at that time, which was psychology. And by the end of this story, she will have made an observation that's gonna change the way we understand storytelling to this day. Now this is actually pretty cool because you, should, you guys should see yourselves. This is what you look like. You're all paying attention, right? This is a story. A story makes you pay attention. This is why we tell stories, because we get people's attention. Another reason why we tell stories is, and, is memory. I didn't get, find a good picture for memory because you mostly find like flash drives and all this nonsense. So uh, I'm gonna call this stickiness. There's also a book that's called Made to Stick that I can highly recommend. It's about marketing but it's all about storytelling. How do you tell a story? How do you tell parts of stories to market and to get people to remember what you're talking about and to get, get to them, I guess? Stickiness is important, and memory is important, when you're doing something that's a bit unusual in data visualization, which is not exploration and analysis of data, but communication. When you're trying to get something across to people, when you're trying to make people change their minds, make decisions, spend money, whatever it is. And for that, you need a mechanism that will actually get to them and then and they will remember what you told them. Because if, it, if you just throw a whole bunch of bar charts in front of them, they're not gonna remember. But the way memory works, and this is why I didn't wanna put those flash drives up there, is not like a computer. We don't just store a piece of information on a shelf somewhere in our brains and then we get back to it and, and retrieve it. But memory is much more like there are these floating bubbles that kind of float through our brains somehow. And this is a slightly mixed metaphor here, but they have like little bits of Vel Velcro stuck to the outside. And when you try to retrieve a memory, what you do is you, you kind of hold out another piece of Velcro and try to, to hook that, hook those memories. And the more hooks you have, the more easily those things will stick and they will stick together. So once you have one of them, another one will, will float by and, and stick to that. And so, but the way memory really works is that you have to know something, you have to remember something to remember something else. And that way you can reconstruct a story. And, and what stories do is they give you some of the connective tissue between those items of information or these pieces of information. 
And that is why stories are so powerful and have been used for many thousands of years, tens of thousands of years probably, to convey information, to pass information on to other generations and uh, to teach people about things. There's even there some arguments that say that, that stories perhaps even predate complex language. That we, we developed more complex grammar and more complex language to be able to express more complex stories because we, were, we want to be able to, to express more complex and more abstract thoughts. I'm not going to go into that direction any further, though. I want to talk a bit about how we can tell stories and how we can tell stories when we, when we talk about data. So, so far, this has all been very kind of general about stories as stories, but how does this work when we talk about data? And there are two elements here, two parts to this. One of them is techniques, and the other one is about structure. And I will argue that there are techniques, visualization techniques, that are specific to, to storytelling. I call them presentation-only techniques. And I should perhaps also preface this by saying that this is not something that I'm 100% I'm done with, or that, that, that's established knowledge, but this is stuff that I'm thinking about. And that I think is, is interesting still to think about. So I, I have a lot of questions. I don't have a whole lot of answers, but maybe I can, I can kind of have you appreciate some of those questions and some of that uncertainty with me. So techniques. There's a technique that I particularly like that is called the connected scatter plot. The way this works is, and so, have any, has anybody seen this before? A bit more exercise here. OK, a few people. This was done by Hannah Fairfield a few years ago. And the way this works is that what you see here is there's a vertical axis, which is the number of car fatalities, and the horizontal axis, which is the number of miles driven. And there's a data point for each year. Now, if you were to just draw this as a 2D scatter plot, it would be a fairly boring, fairly sparse set of dots you know, on a scatter plot. But by connecting those points with lines, you're now creating something that is much more interesting, that, has, that actually tells you a story. There are little arrows on here that tell you which way time flows. This is from 1950 to 2012 or 2011, I believe. And you can look at this, and you can see that there is kind of a small structure. There are, there are individual steps. And there's a larger structure where you can see how the direction changes. So sometimes the line goes up, essentially, up and to the right. Sometimes it goes down and to the right, and, or to, even to the left, backwards a little bit on itself. And, and, and there are little annotations there that have these little spark lines that tell you which part of that, of that overall shape they're talking about. And as you see more of this, as I'm revealing more of this here, you can see something that you haven't seen before in a line chart, which is a loop. And then you remember that, of course, the, the horizontal axis is not time, because time goes along the, char the chart or along the, the, the line but number of miles driven. And so as the number of miles driven drops, perhaps the number of fatalities also was dropping, and that created that, that kind of loop. And the whole thing also makes for a very pleasing, very interesting uh, page layout and, and page design. This is, this is one of my favorite news graphics. And I think it's a really good example of how you can turn a small number of data points, this is 60 data points or so, into a very compelling story. Of course, there's not just the data points. There's also a little bit more background there. But you turn something that is just a bunch of numbers into something that is interesting to explore, that people will spend time with and, and want to know what it is and want to, to read those annotations and read all the stuff around it. So these techniques are really powerful, or this technique can be very powerful, when it's used the right way. And you've seen an example, uh, you, may, you may not even have uh, noticed it, but there was an example in, uh, in Jeff Hare's talk, and you will see a few more of these, I think, tomorrow when, when Hannah talks about these. The nice thing about this technique in particular is that it's actually a really bad technique. <laughs> because and, and if you were to talk to a lot of visualization academics, they would probably look at this and they say, yes, but this is not general. This is not going to work for this and that. And they're right. So this, here's an example. <laughs> How to make a hairball and not even use a node link diagram. <laughs> there you go. And I would, I would even say that most, for most data sets that you can find, this, it would look like this. So you get all kinds of really horrible, stupid hairballs when you play with this. This is uh, unemployment data, uh, labor, labor force data versus unemployment. I think this is all changed, indexed in the year 2000 or something like that. 
And I thought it would be a good, good idea, it would be a fun demo, and it was just pointless, but, or even, it's actually a good bad, dem bad demo, I guess. But in many cases, it doesn't actually work. But that, that actually, in, in a way, that's the strength of this technique, that it works for some things really well, and for many others, it just doesn't. And I think that that should be okay. That, that, is, that is not a common sentiment you will hear in, uh, in the visualization world. A case in point was this thing, which was published um, a few years ago, I think 2008 or so, um, by Amanda Cox and Lee Byron and a few other people in the New York Times. And uh, this is called the uh, stream graph. And there was a paper about that at InfoViz, I think a year later. And there was a huge controversy about how that, how bad this basically was. Anybody remember that? Does anybody hang, hang out in those places? Okay. So there was a basically a lot of, you know, this should never have been uh, accepted as a paper at InfoViz. And, you know, it's terrible because the problem is that, so what you see here is, is uh, box office um, numbers for a number of movies and, over, over time. And they're all stacked. And if you know anything about stacked bar charts or stacked area charts, you know that the, the problem with those is that the, the baseline is all different for, for all of these. So it's hard to compare across because the, the lower element or the lo lower segment is going to push up the baseline. And so you can't really see what the shape is that's on top because it's being distorted by the lower one, right? And that is, that is totally true. And this is true for this chart. But it's also not the point. The point of this is to get people who don't know a whole lot about, about this data to start and explore that and to see the large differences, to see the large patterns that are going on here and, and look at those. And those you can still see. And it's a compelling, interesting chart that was printed on a half a page lengthwise or two thirds of a page lengthwise on, uh, on, in a newspaper, which is an impressive, huge thing to look at and to explore and to actually spend time with. And so this is a way of telling story. There's also, I forgot to say this earlier, about the connected scatterplot, there's of course a time element. So a, a large part of me arguing for and against stories involves time and, and narration and narrative. And so we have an element of this here. It's not quite as strong as, previous, as the, the connected scatterplot was, but there is an element of time here, and this is the same, same here as well. So techniques that work well in some cases, especially when they are well suited to, to engage people and to get their attention and to keep them hooked at least for a few minutes, I think are really good for, for this kind of, of, uh, of, of task, I guess, uh, even though they might not be. Again, this is not just like before. This is not a channel technique. I, I will not tell you use this instead of scatter plots or, or bar charts for exploration of data, no. But this is a really good way of getting people interested and, and uh, to pay attention. Another one I'm just going to mention because it's something I've spent some time on recently is uh, what's called the isotype. Anybody heard of the isotype? Isotype charts? Oh yeah, a few people, okay. This is an idea that was developed in the 1920s in Vienna by uh, Otto Neurath and his wife Marie Neurath and a guy named Gerd Arns. The way this works is that it uses little icons, little symbols to represent multiples. So this is the number of weavers working at home, those are the black figures, or in factories, the red figures, and uh, how that changes over time. So this is across the, or long, um, this is over the 19th century and essentially tells you the story of the Industrial Revolution. Those little, little red boxes there are factories and sometimes, for some reason, people get com confused by this. The things that are sticking out are smokestacks, okay? So that's smoke there. I, I don't know, in the past, people have been confused by what that actually is. It's not, I don't know what, what else it would be, but, okay, they're factories, okay? They're steam engines, that's, that's what they do, they, they produce smoke. And so you can see how over time the, the number of people changes, and if you look at the legends there, it's a bit hard to read perhaps, but each little person represents 10,000 people, 10,000 workers, and each, each little uh, blue bundle represents some number 50 million pounds of, of product. And you can see how that was increasing very dramatically over time whereas the number of, of workers was essentially flat. It, was, it didn't change a whole lot over that, that entire century. So this is a technique that is interesting because it's, it, has, it has shapes and it has stuff to look at, and you can actually remember this much better than a bar chart because bars don't have shapes. We've, had, we've done some work and it's going to be published at a conference in a few weeks. And also, since I'm a recovering academic, I have to 
to show this next chart because there's really no way of not doing that, I guess, in a talk. So there is <laughs> Napoleon's March, uh, which you've, anybody seen this before? <laughs> okay, I'm gonna just very briefly explain, but this is just for those few people who may not have. So what you see here is this tan ribbon that's going left to right is uh, Napoleon's army, the number of men in Napoleon's army starts at 422,000, that's the width is the number of men and goes from a place called Kovno in Lithuania, or what's today Lithuania, to Moscow. He ends up with 100,000 in Moscow. Turns around, goes back, and comes back with, with 10,000 of his 422,000. I think it's actually a connected scatter plot in, in a way. Uh, it's, it connects points on a map. Uh, it also represents the, the width, the, the people there is width. And I think it is, it's, it's often hailed as this, this amazing example of a statistical graphic, but what it really is, in my opinion, is a super narrow chart for one particular purpose. It worked exactly for that and for nothing else. I, I challenge you to produce something using that same idea that actually works for some other data, not for the same data. People have tried different approaches for the same data, and they've mostly been horrible. So try this on different data, and, and I almost guarantee it's not going to work. For once, it's a good thing that Napoleon invaded Russia and not the other way around because we can read this left to right first and so it makes a much more compelling story. So people say that this is telling a story, which is only true because we read it a certain way. And then uh, there's actually another one on the, same, on the same page, on the same sheet. Charles Minard, who produced this, this map, had a, a map of, um, a map of, of uh, I forget the name, but um, an invasion that was going from southern Spain into Italy. And so the problem was that that direction changed a bit and he was going and, and um, was going, so that, that, that army was going north. And so what he did, he actually rotated that map by about 45 degrees so that it would actually work. So it would be red left to right. So if you want to try this for the Oregon Trail or for you know, something like that, good luck. So that's, that's what I mean though, this is, this is really specific and I think it, it can be very valuable to do very specific things, but we have to also appreciate that they are very specific and, we're not, and, not, and not pretend or, or, or try to, to make everything as general and as generic as a scatter plot or a bar chart. Now the second part of the how is about structure. And I'm interested here in low level structure. So I'm, I, I used to talk in the past about narrative arc and how this all works, but I'm, I'm gonna talk about very low level stuff today because I think it's actually perhaps even more useful than, than that. And I'm going to show you an example of, of what I mean by that. This is, a, this is perhaps my favorite story from the news that, that this is from a few years ago, I think this was done in 2007 or 8, about the Copenhagen climate talks that took place in 2007. Uh, and it's, it's a very nice stepper. So uh, Jim was mentioning this earlier. So this is, this is an example of a stepper, no scrolling here, uh, simple stepping. And it walks you through a little argument. So I'm going to show you this very briefly. So it starts with this map, which doesn't do a whole lot. But then we get to the interesting part. So this is now for uh, emissions for four different countries, China, the US, Europe, which is a total country like Africa, and <laughs> India. And you can see total emissions here. And uh, these talks are always about seeing things a certain way. So looking at total emissions is one way, but, but that's only one way of looking at it. And then you could look at things like emissions per capita, which of course looks quite different because China and India have so, so many more people, so that, that looks quite a bit different than, than before. And then, of course, emissions come from industry, so why not look at a measure like GDP? And that's very nice for China, because China's GDP has been skyrocketing, and so if you use that number that's been growing almost exponentially to, to normalize your data, it looks like the number's actually dropping quite a bit. And then you can say, well, let's use that and extrapolate into the future and expect that GDP will be increasing like it, like it is right now, like it was at that point. And, uh, but in, in terms of absolute numbers, then this means that, which is not quite as good. And so apparently at this point, 
the, 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 the US uh, said, well, actually, let's try this with uh, absolute numbers instead and do this. So this walks you through a little argument. And the nice thing about this is that it has a sort of punchline. And, but in, in particular, what's important about it is that it's individual steps. So I'm not against scrolling, but <laughs> I am against the idea that just because you can scroll, you can just do things that are super continuous and people will actually understand what's going on. Because we know from psychology and from cognitive psychology research that when you look, when, when you think about, about event, uh, if you, when you think about um, things that happened, trying to find a, a general, general term here, what you remember are events. You don't remember, remember all, the, all the, the, the time in between. So when somebody tells you how to, to, how to come here from the park plaza, they're going to tell you where to turn. They're not going to tell you to walk, 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 and then go. And, you know, all this, this in, boring bits will not just not be even there. You wouldn't even think about doing that. So this is why I like this kind of representation, because it shows you that. It shows you the important parts here. And uh, I'm not against animation. Well, actually, I am against animation, uh, <laughs> except, except when it's uh, about transitions. So transitions are really useful. And actually, what I left out here in the, in the example when I showed you this, I just showed you the images. There, those, are, those transitions, the, those steps are animated, which is very useful because it's much easier to follow what's going on uh, when that is the case. But when you look at this, you might look at this the way it's laid out here, which, which I just like to see because that, that shows me everything and I can understand the structure of this of this little narrative. I can look at this and you say, well, you know, this reminds me of a comic. And so why don't we think about comics and how comics work a little bit and how people have been drawing comics and constructing comics. And I really like this little image uh, from uh, Scott McCloud's book where he quotes Will, Will Eisner's term who calls comics the sequential art. And the interesting thing about McLeod also, and I think this is an argument he's also taking from Eisner, I'm not entirely sure who actually started with that, is that he talks about how things happen between the frames. So each frame is a snapshot, each, each frame is an event, but there is time passing between them. And that, that time can be useful because that is something you can, you, can talk, you can imply, but you don't necessarily have to show it. And what's also happening here is that there is a change between frames, between adjacent frames, and there are different ways of managing those changes or of showing different things between those frames, I guess. It's not a bit too fancy when I say managing those changes. And uh, McLeod has six different steps that he, that he has here. So there's this book, I should mention, uh, Understanding Comics by Scott McLeod. If you haven't read it, I strongly suggest you do. It's really good. It's a lot of fun to read. It's, it's an actual comic. And it's just extremely well laid out, and, and you, can, you can learn a ton from it. There's a lot in there. I just stole this part from it for this talk, where he talks about these different, different steps from one frame to the next. And when you think about those, you, can, you, can, you will find that if you want to tell a story about, about anything, whether it's a story about people or about data or about anything, you will find that some of those will apply. So a change from moment to moment, where you go from, from one step in time to the next, where things happen over time. Or action to action, which is something happens, something else happens. Uh, subject to subject, which you basically, like in a movie, you, you change the frame or the, the, you cut. Uh, scene to scene, where you have a larger change between uh, what, what you're looking at. Aspect to aspect is basically the same thing, but seen from different points of view. Like you just saw in that Copenhagen example, there will be different aspects of the same thing. And then there's the non sequitur, which is just random things that you can juxtapose, which is actually surprisingly common in news graphics. Um, the, uh, there's, there's this whole thing about how news graphics start by giving you kind of this quick overview, and then they, they go into more details. And so some of the examples, even some of the ones that we've seen today, in my opinion, uh, are, are somewhat non secretors. But um, uh, it's kind of interesting to, to watch that sometimes. They're not necessarily constructed like, like, like stories. Now, this book is about 10 years old. No, my math is off. Um, it came out in 1993, which makes it 20 something. <laughs> That's 10 years old. But anyway, so uh, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> okay, so 23 years old. So, so. Um, so it's been around for a while. OK. Still a good book. Highly recommended. <laughs> but people have built on it. And uh, one of those people uh, is Neil Cohn. 
Anybody heard of Neil Cohn before? Okay, not many people. So he has, uh, he's now doing, uh, a, I think he's a professor now at uh, UC San Diego. Or maybe he's a postdoc, I'm not entirely sure. But he's done some really interesting work around comics and the, the cognitive side of comics. And uh, he, he has this classification. He basically argues a little bit against McLeod, but, but the two actually work really well together in a way where he, he talks about these different frames and what the frame itself represents. So he doesn't, he, he's not interested in the space between the frames as in the frames themselves. And so he has this classification of frames that, that he kind of uses to, to, to understand what, what the structure is of a comic. And he uses a lot of these, these four frame uh, examples. So I'm gonna show you two of those. This first frame here is what's, what he calls an establisher. And uh, he has these little letters for that. So E is for establisher. And uh, this first one, this establisher tells you where you are. So before I showed you this, you did not, not know what this next slide was gonna be or what this comic was gonna be about. This is what this tells you. It tells you that there's this couple sitting there. Then there's the initial. The initial is the start of the action. So this is when, the, when, when something is, is, is starting to happen. And there's the peak. And the peak is where the action peaks, where the main thing happens. So she slaps him. And then there's the release. And the release, and of course this is a bit funnier when, when I'm, there's not a guy talking here about it, but um, the release is basically the, the part where it, it's funny because now you're past that peak point and, and you're kind of waiting for the reaction or you're kind of waiting for what's happening next. And he calls this the EIPR model. So E for initial, I for, sorry, E for establisher, I for initial, P for peak, and then R for release. And that's a fairly common model in lots of these, these little four-pane comic strips. It's another example that, that shows this. So the doggy sees a ball, doggy runs after the ball, doggy gets caught in a soccer game, and then hides somewhere. And so it's kind of a little, a little comic, and, but it, it establishes a little structure. So the, the individual items are classified on kind of the bottom level as individual frames, but the whole structure, the EIPR, essentially makes a, a, an arc, a narrative arc. And you can imagine mapping those ideas to those frames and thinking about how that actually works. And I, I would argue that there is a certain amount of that in here, that there are a few other things that are going on here, but this actually works fairly well as this kind of structure, even though it's six frames or seven actually, but I'm ignoring the first one. And so these steps are imp important because as I said, we remember those events. And, um, and you can structure, you can think about data, and you can think about the views that you create and, and how those actually fit together and, and use those kind of ideas for, for structuring a story. And when you look at, at how, how steps work and how, how steps actually are expressed, even in some of the scrolly telling examples, you will find that people do that. So this is an example that just came out last year, or last, huh, last week. Um, at the Washington Post, I think, did this uh, idea of, of scroll up Mount Everest from sea level. And, uh, but even though you can kind of scroll forever in this thing, uh, you, can, you, you will see that there are events marked on, that, on, this, on this overview and there are events as you scroll along. If this were just, the, uh, just scrolling up all the way, it would be super boring and you wouldn't actually remember what you did along the way because, because you would just keep scrolling through drawings of Mount Everest. And then here's my last part um, about when. When do you tell stories? And in a way, this is really the same question as the why, right? Because it's when do you tell stories? Well, when those things apply that I talked about earlier. So, another blank frame here. Who did I tell you, who, who was this person that told you a story about at the beginning? Anybody remember her nationality? Okay, what year? 1920s, okay. Where was this set? Okay. Why do you remember that? I mean, seriously, this is not gonna get you fed. It's not gonna get you laid. Uh, maybe you can try this out tonight, but it's not, you know, this is not, there is no, no reason why you would have to remember this. But, but there is maybe one reason that, that you would remember that. And that is because I haven't told you who this woman was. Anybody have a guess? Lynn knows. So her name was Bluma Saigarnik, not a household name, but a very, very famous uh, a psychologist from the, I guess, the first half of the 20th century. And there's this effect that's called the Saigarnik effect. 
which is about how we remember things that are unfinished. And what she, what she, what she found in this, in this bar or in this pub or whatever she went to is that the waiters there would take orders and would remember them, uh, even for large groups, and they would rem remember them really well until they were paid for, and then they would just forget them. And that is an effect that's really, really effective in making you remember things. So we remember the story because as the story unfolds, it's unfinished. And then, but we have to remember the pieces of it until the end. And this is a very effective way also of getting people to keep paying attention to things by using something that's called a cliffhanger. So when, when a, uh, an episode <laughs> of, a, of, a, of, of some sort of, of series ends in a cliffhanger, then the, you want to keep watching. You're kinda, gonna tune in the next week, you know, in the old days, or you're gonna binge watch the whole thing on Netflix. And, and that's, that, that's why, because it teases the next thing. So when do we want to tell stories? Well, if you're looking for attention, memory, or if you just wanna see a guy hang off a cliff. All right, thank you so much, and I'm happy to answer questions for this time. <laughs>